to do what's called a homography, a, a mapping, a transformation from something in one plane to something in another plane. So if this is the arm in one plane and here's another arm in a different plane, if they are, have the exact same shape, then the positions of corresponding points can be computed using what's called a projection matrix. That the position here is just an operation on the, the position here. Uh, and if I give you two arms, I can estimate this projection matrix. But that's not what our case is. We don't have identical shapes. So if I have one arm and a different arm with different shapes, I can always find a transformation that will make the thumbs overlap, but then the elbows don't. If I can find a different transformation, make the elbows overlap, then the thumbs don't. What's the best overall transformation that minimizes the sum of the squares? Uh, and Jimmy Kuminisi really uh, did this, and it involves uh, Lagrange optimization. I won't go through all the details, but there's real math here. And at the end, you take the transformation, you find what's the best transformation of one arm onto the other. And again, you get this whopping eight to 10 centimeters, much, much, much too large to be consistent with Hockney's uh, theory. It turns out there is one part of the Arnolfini chandelier that is in reasonable perspective, and that's the bobesh or the uh, panel holders. So I took a perfect hexagon and used that mathematics and said, try and make this hexagon as close to the positions of the bobesh as possible, and they match pretty well. Okay, this is a mess, as we know. Not an aesthetic judgment, it's not in perfect perspective, but uh, this is pretty good. Well, how impressive is that? As part of my research, Nicholas Williams, a uh, realist painter in the south of England, painted two chandeliers entirely by eye for my research. One, it was a uh, five-armed chandelier, and so I took a pentagon and I computer did the transformation and found that it was as good, in fact slightly better, than Van Eyck's. And then he painted this really lovely complex chandelier too. This painting now hangs over my bed in, uh, in California. And I did my computer analysis and it looks really good, except one arm. Uh, it's not much, but it's statistically significantly off. One of those arms is wrong. And I emailed him, I said, what's going on? And he said, oh yeah, I accidentally dropped the chandelier, and one arm broke off, and I could calculate uh, how much. I said 1.5 centimeters, and he said measured at 1.3, close enough. So let me show you just how accurately he got the perspective on this entirely by eye. No projections, no rulers, no measurement, nothing. Here are two of those arms uh, uh, segmented, or uh, where we erase the background. And then we transform this arm one using the mathematics I just showed you to be as similar to arm two as we can. And that's what we get here. So this is transform arm one into just this. Now, this mathematics is for a plane to a plane. Anything that sticks out of the plane won't work. So don't worry about the fact that the pan is too big. But we're, it's just not part of the, the deal. And now you overlap this with this. They overlap superbly, only about a millimeter off anywhere. Again, he painted these entirely by eye, just sitting down in the studio and painting. You don't need optical projections to get something in uh, good perspective. And this is far better than anything in uh, the uh, Arnofini chandelier, as, as I showed you before. Well, uh, I want to end with some sort of high level notes on uh, ideas on connoisseurship. And I think if we look at the history of connoisseurship, the, the great connoisseurs of uh, previous times, Morelli and Berenson, Max Riedler, and so forth. These were used, these uh, scholars uh, uh, used their brilliance and, and extensive knowledge to do things like authentication or the identification of hands, that is, how many artists contributed to a given work. Uh, they traced stylistic influences. Oh, I can see the work of this artist in uh, this other artist, and so forth. They also made benchmarks of quality. This painting is better than uh, something else. That, this has really fallen out of favor in academic art history departments. Um, considered elitist and uh, subjective and so forth. Um, so in university art history departments, kind of sure it's parodied as elitist, making judgment as sort of beyond scholarly debate. I mean, it's true if you go back to some of them, you know, Berenson would say, you know, I'm sure this is by Leonardo and uh, you don't know as much as I do. I'm parodying now, I'm making uh, black and white, but uh, in essence, uh, it, it was beyond sort of objective tests and so forth. And it's been, there's a lot of theory in uh, academic art history departments now. And um, it used to rely on the authority of the connoisseur and the valorization of the object. And it led to 
what's been written about called the two art histories, the museum and the university, where in the museum, the curators and conservators really care about the object in front of them, uh, the appearance of it, the materiality of it, and so forth, whereas in the university, since really the late 70s in particular, um, uh, there was this focus on theory, and the objects really aren't quite as uh, important. Not everyone, of course, but some. And um, if you talk to some of these conservators, they have, to them, horror stories. And a famous curator uh, told me about being in her museum when an art historian from a university came in uh, to one of the galleries and said, oh my god, there's my painting. I wrote a book on that. This was the first time the artist uh, the art historian had seen that painting. So what I'm hoping is that my work is going to help bring back this really close uh, observation of the work itself. And personally, my own deep interest in all this, which beyond my deep love of art and love of truth, um, is one central question, which I think is one of the most important questions in all of science and some of the humanities, and it is this. How do images convey meaning? This is a profoundly hard question, and I just wish more art historians would focus on that, because they're standing, they're in, immersed in examples of that, and they, they can help work on it. So it's changing now that we have high-resolution multispectral data, and we have software and expertise, and I'm starting to teach a course on digital connoisseurship, and museums are embracing the public. So I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about how things are going to go. Uh, in the future. Thank you very much. There we go. So I'm sure there are questions. I hope there are questions. No? Yeah. So um, your, your career has gone, uh, is very um, varied. Yes. And I'm wondering how is it that you have focused on, on visual art uh, recently? Uh, well, Sorry. I'm a very serious musician. I'm on, I think, seven compact discs, and I play seriously. I play with Pavarotti. But um, I come from a family steeped in the arts. My great grandfather was a court painter at Crown Prince Rudolf in Austria, and I've uh, through all the crazy uncles in my, and sculptors and so forth, but down to my little sister Kathy, who was the chief calligrapher in the White House under Bill Clinton. So we've got real talent. Uh, and my grandfather had a great art collection and so forth. So the arts have been a big deal in our family. Um, and I, I, you know, loved it. And for a moment as a child, I thought, oh, I'd love to be an art historian. And it was this lack of answers that, uh, uh, this, it, uh, that I found very unsatisfying. Um, that sometimes there are answers. And I'm not revolutionizing the interpretation. You know, I'm answering certain technical questions, and to me, there, uh, there's an incredible satisfaction of being able to tell where that light is, or whether this was done using, um, and, you know, and putting it on a ground that we can really debate and argue, and at the end, there is an answer. There is an answer. We might not get to it, but there is an answer, but a lot of other things in our history aren't, and that's great, I, I try to, uh, but personally, that's what's really motivated me. Hope that's an answer. <laughs> I'm not sure there are more questions. Yeah. Um, I have a basic question just about Hawking's thesis. Um, I guess I don't even understand really how it was supposed to work. It seems to me if it was the sun illuminating the mm -hmm. picture, the sun would shift and the picture would shift. Would if it was a small window, it wouldn't stay there for very long. And so how many for the contours, for the contours, it stayed. The, the contours would stay forever. I mean, even if the sunlight goes around, the position of this contour would stay the same. The shading would change, yeah, right. and maybe the, so. And you can work pretty quickly uh, under these. So that is not a strong criticism of this work. You can, and I've done it. I've made little projections, and you can trace something in ten minutes. Uh, in fact, in the scene I showed you, probably did that in I don't know fifteen minutes. So you don't have to worry about. That. The diagonal motion of the, uh, the sunset. But, but the shading, I mean, the, the sketches that would be done quickly wouldn't contain the shading. Is that right? Let me answer the question that I'm often asked because it answers, what well, part of it is this. And the question is, oh, did the old master chief? Probably not. Uh, so, what, what was the source of realism around 1430, right? 
we have this change. Hawking says it was optics. And I said, no. Well, then what was? Um, first thing to realize, as you point out, is it would not have been tracing. Tracing gives you the outlines, uh, just the contours. It's like having a, uh, a child's coloring book with the Mona Lisa. And say, all right, here are the contours. I'll fill it in, right? Um, now, I should, uh, in Hawking's events, say he also has a secondary theory. It's not one that's gotten the airplay and so forth. But he says, ah, just to see a projected image is to change your understanding of what an image could be. I mean, it does, see the projected image is really quite amazing, especially back then. Uh, and it solved the problem of rendering three dimensions on two dimensions and so forth. And maybe uh, they were influenced. The fact that there's no documentary evidence of it and uh, none of this technical analysis has any bearing on it. So I just throw up my shoulders and hands and say, okay, you know, uh, maybe, but maybe not. And it's, it's very hard to either way. So as you point out, tracing would have helped. What, what would have made a difference? Well, oil paints. This was exactly the time in the rise of the use of oil paints. Uh, Van Eyck was called the father of modern oil painting. Oil paints afford a wider range of lightness, um, whiter whites, blacker blacks, more saturated, richer colors. They afford a number of layering and glazing techniques. Uh, if you think of um, Rembrandt, who put down 52 layers of paint, of uh, paint and um, uh, other uh, layers and so forth. Um, later in the South, in Italy, they would grind glass to add luster to the paints. But perhaps most importantly, oil paints dry slowly. So if you get that nose wrong, uh, you can come back tomorrow or next week or next year and fix it. You can't do that with a tempera or gesso or the, the, uh, the uh, uh, needle of beauty water. Humanism, this is a time where, I mean, it's the Renaissance after all, beginning of the Renaissance. We start caring about Mr. Arnolfini and him as an individual, what he looks like. And likewise, secularism, we now, of course, there are lots of religious uh, works being uh, produced, but now we care about those oranges on his uh, shelf because they show they came from Spain and show how rich he was and so forth. So this observation of the secular world uh, in the Renaissance is extremely important. And patronage, you better make Mr. Arnolfini look really good. He's going to tell all his wealthy, wealthy Medici banker friends where they're going to commission you to make a portrait of them. Um, geometrical perspective, for some paintings, has nothing to do with Robert Campan's a man, of course. But, um, and it's somewhat later, but it helps uh, give a coherent spatial structure to uh, uh, some paintings. And there was, I'll call it competition from realist sculpture. If you think what was happening with sculpture at this time, going from you know, um, the sculptures on the outside of uh, Notre Dame, and then you go to uh, Pietà, uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, this incredible realism, and no one's suggesting they use laser range finders or not, you know, some <laughs> Um, but the uh, painting community had to sort of keep up with this, and so that helped. And my good friend and colleague and fellow Hockney writers, um, Christopher Tyler, even before this Hockney thing ever began, had a partial explanation for it that is optical, but it's entirely different from Hockney's. And it is the rise in the use of eyeglasses or spectacles. And those of us over 40 who paint and are trying to see something far away, and then our canvas are really helped by this. And this is exactly the time of the rise of the use of uh, uh, spectacles. And in fact, in Hawking's book, he writes, it seems like artists put on their eyeglasses for the first time around 1438. He may be more correct than even two glasses. So those are uh, much more plausible. Personally, I won't get to in 60 minutes. 